Hello everybody and welcome to our Green Cover Seed uh, 2021 cover crop plots. Uh, my name is Keith Burns and I'm here with Davis Bailey and uh, we're going to give you a little bit of a tour uh, of our plots here. Uh, Davis, these are some of the nicest plots I think we've ever had. Great job to you and, and your team for uh, doing the planting and the weeding and doing all this. Tell us a little bit about when these were planted and the conditions they were planted into. We planted all of these plots on May 26th. We feel like the end of May or May 20th-ish uh, is a great time frame for us to be able to plant both our warm season plants and our cool season plants. Uh, we're on the tail end of when we would normally plant those cool season plants and we're at the very beginning of when we would be planting most of those warm season plants. So for doing tours and stuff like that, this time of year we feel like that time frame gives us the ability um, to plant it all at once. Yeah. So, so about 60 days, we're looking at close to 60 days of growth. Right, yeah. right. Um, we planted into two different sets of conditions here. Um, up front, hopefully you can see the divide there where it's mowed out. Where we're at right here was planted into uh, sprayed out rye. The rye was sprayed out about 30 days before when we planted. Um, beyond that was still tall, green, growing rye. Uh, pollen had been dropping. Um, it was time to roll our crimp, so it worked out well to be able to just plant straight from these conditions into those conditions. Uh, that was really interesting because we actually had a wet part of the year then, and so uh, things like our bigger seeded uh, cover crops, some of them weren't getting as deep into the ground as we wanted to, especially where we had the mat already down, but where we were planting into the standing rye, uh, there was a little bit more moisture usage, and so we could get it down a little bit deeper where we needed it. Yeah, so it's gonna be really interesting, and as we go through here, uh, on some of these plots, we'll point out differences between uh, where there was less residue, where, where the cover crop was, was sprayed out ahead of time, and where we planted green. Uh, this, this was all planted with a Great Plains no-till drill. Uh, just kind of a stock no-till drill, nothing fancy on it. Had, had the coulter up front, but you know, very much like uh, what, what many of you would be using. Uh, and, and I know Davis was a little nervous about planting into that five foot, six foot tall rye, especially with some of these small seeds. Uh, but as you see, as we go through here, uh, we think we actually got a better stand where we had you know, what, 10 times more residue to plant through. Yeah, it, like you said, it was nerve wracking. It's something that we really encourage people to look at roller crimping. Uh, but I myself was very nervous <laughs> going into uh, rye that was as tall as the drill was. Um, but it, it worked out surprisingly well, especially like you said, on the small seeds where you would maybe be most nervous. Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we'll start with the legumes, we'll move into grasses, and then we'll go to the brassicas, and then our other broad leaves. And then kind of the uh, the crowning achievement of all of our plots is the mixes. There's, there's some beautiful things to look at when we get down to the mixes. So I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, let's start with clovers. Uh, you know, we plant clovers in monoculture strips simply to show you why you shouldn't plant clovers in monoculture strips. Now what Davis I don't think did mention, this front part, uh, he and his team have spent many, many, many hours pulling weeds uh, because we wanted to be able to show you what the plants look like. But in the background, where uh, beyond the mowing, that has never been weeded. So you'll be able to see the weed pressure that is coming in these plots. And, and one of the things that we noticed with clovers, there's a lot of weed pressure. Clovers are not that great at suppressing weeds early on. They're, they're a little bit of a slow starter, and so the, the weeds can get a hold and they can get a, an advantage on the clovers oftentimes. And so that's why we like clovers as part of a mix. We don't like clovers by themselves, unless you're trying to grow seed production or something like this. So we've got, uh, we've got our frosty bursim clover. Bursim clovers uh, are one of the clovers that tolerate heat uh, better than most other clovers. Uh, uh, Persian and, and bursim clovers both will do that. And then of course we've got crimson clover, probably one of the most popular clovers in the cover cropping industry. It's relatively inexpensive. It grows relatively fast. Uh, and it's just a really hardy clover. So I don't know that we need to talk a lot about clovers because again, uh, they're, they're really nice parts of mixes and we'll see them show up down in the mixes. Uh, but, but if you can really see the amount of weed pressure that's coming uh, where we didn't have uh, any weeding done. These are the medics. 
Uh, medics are actually closely related to alfalfa, more closely related to alfalfa and sweet clover than they are the other clovers. Uh, the, the Latin uh, term for alfalfa is medicago, and that's the same root word that we get medic from. And so medics, uh, again, Davis, these are things that we don't sell a lot of, but we're really looking at it because we think it's got some specialty applications. Uh, they, they grow low like a clover does. They're kind of a ground cover type plant. These are uh, relatively fast growing annuals. Uh, I would say for the most part, probably grow a little faster than the clovers, have the a little bit better weed suppression. You can see in the background there, I think there's less weeds in the medics than there is in the clovers. And so, uh, they're, they're, again, they're, they're more difficult to find. There's not a lot of people in the United States growing medics. Uh, as a general rule, these mostly come from Australia again. Uh, Davis, why don't you talk a little bit about where and how we're looking at using medics? Yeah, like you said, this is something that most acres in the United States, we wouldn't be spending a lot of time with these. But one place where we do see them uh, sometimes showing up naturally is in orchards and vineyards um, out in California that I know they've got a lot of burr medic. Uh, and it works well as another low growing option, uh, something to cover the ground quick. Uh, and it's gonna produce some nitrogen as well. Uh, so, so we like it in that application and hopefully something that we can carry a little bit more of for people who are, uh, a lot of those people don't need a high producing cover crop. Uh, sometimes it's just too much, yeah. uh, too much biomass mass and so keeping it low growing something that's going to suppress the weeds uh, but when the moisture turns off in the summer something that's also going to decompose quickly so they can have a clean yeah. floor to harvest off of yeah and so this is one that we would be looking at you know how shade tolerant is it what is the reseeding potential uh, you know will that be an issue so this may be one that we start putting in some of the corn the v3 v4 corn interseedings because uh, it is going to be low growing, uh, not super competitive, but it is a legume, so it's contributing some nitrogen. Uh, so again, one we're keeping our eye on. If we find one that we really like, then we just got to find somebody in Australia to grow seed for us. Right. And one thing uh, also to mention is just, I think, like you said, somewhat similarly related to the clovers, um, but I would say just a little bit more resilient. Around here, we see a lot of black medic showing up in uh, areas that aren't managed uh, yeah. too well it's just a very resilient option too okay now we come to our hairy vetches this is one of my favorite parts of the plot tour always because hairy vetch is just an awesome plant it's the most winter hardy of all the legumes that we have and we saw that when we looked at our overwintering plots <clears throat> we typically wouldn't think hairy vetch would look this great because this really looks great planted in may it's just not its time frame we've had a decent amount of hot weather uh, since we planted these plots, but these vetches look really, really good. And I'm going to point out a couple of differences here. Uh, this is AU Merit, uh, and then this is what we call our Montana hairy vetch. Uh, it's, it's just a kind of a variety not stated, but we've had the same guy in Montana growing it for, for many, many years. What I want you to notice is how much more growth this AU Merit has uh, than any of the other vetches. And, and, and this AU Merit it has more growth, summer growth, than any vetch I've ever seen. I think what's going on here is that it's a little bit facultative, which basically means it, it can vernalize and overwinter. Uh, we've been growing it up in Montana and it's overwintering fine up there, but it doesn't have to. It, it can also act as a spring annual. And so that's, that's what's known as facultative when it can act as a winter annual or as a spring annual. <clears throat> and when it doesn't have to vernalize, it just gets out and it grows faster. And this just has a very impressive amount of growth. We've got a nice little ladybug here. Uh, later, er, earlier on, I saw a bunch of bumblebees out here on, on the uh, blossoms. And again, if you look in the background, there's a few weeds out there, but there's not many. Davis, what were your observations on the vetches here? One of the first things out of the ground when we planted May 26th, all three of these vetches were uh, one thing I'd like to point out is in the when fall planted, these two were neck and neck as we were evaluating all spring and really for when most people would be terminating those cover crops, I think uh, you could you could almost interchange them. But like you said, when we're spring planting, first off, we normally wouldn't consider this an option, but as we've proven here, it really should be. Um, so yeah, the AU Merit just jumps out way ahead uh, and because of that facultative trait, uh, really is a good fit right now. Acts more like a spring vetch, like the woolly pod we have over there. Mm -hmm. 
And, and the other thing that we get people asking questions a lot about, especially our organic guys who are wanting to grow as much nitrogen as they can for their corn crop, they say, how early can I plant veg? How early can I plant veg? Because they're wanting to plant it this summer and still have the big growth next spring. What I would be worried about, I don't think this vetch here is ever going to survive the winter, mostly because it's going to, it, it's far enough along, it will, uh, it's blooming, it'll set pods, it'll make seed. It will just die a natural death before it ever gets to the winter. So for, for the organic folks who are asking, how soon can I plant vetch and to get it to over winter? I try to hold them off until at least the first week in August because we do not want this much growth going into the fall if you want it to overwinter. Now, if you want to plant it in March or April and just let it grow through the summer, get as much growth as you can, terminate it and then plant something else, great. You could, I think you could plant this with cow peas and mung beans and other warm season things and still have some good nitrogen fixing, but don't plant it that early and think that it's going to overwinter. Now the Montana vetch, because it is more of a winter annual, uh, this is still fairly impressive, but again, it's I would say it's 50% less biomass perhaps than the AU Merit, uh, and that's not surprising because it's it's more of a true winter annual, uh, and we just don't see this facultative trait expressed like we do with the AU Merit. Uh, we'll talk next about the Woolly Pod vetch because it is more of a spring annual. So Woolly Pod vetch, uh, Davis, un unlike the true hairy vetch, which is a strong winter annual, Woolly Pod vetch, I refer to it as a very cold tolerant spring annual. So it, it, is, it do, definitely does not have to vernalize. Uh, it can survive some winters so though. We, we had good woolly pod vetch survival this year in our overwintering plots, uh, largely because we had good snow cover, but uh, it will overwinter in milder climates very reliably. And in fact, in Australia, where a lot of this has grown, uh, they don't really even have hairy vetch. If you see hairy vetch coming out of Australia, it's likely gonna be woolly pod vetch because they just don't get nearly as cold as we do. So it's got plenty of cold tolerance for that climate. Uh, because it is more of a spring annual instead of winter annual, we see more growth on it than we do on our true winter annual Montana vetch. Uh, but I don't know, it's maybe pretty close to the AU Merit biomass wise, growth wise. Uh, but the AU Merit definitely is keeping up with a true uh, spring annual woolly pod vetch. Uh, again, Davis, your observations on woolly pod. The main difference besides what you mentioned that I see is the amount of blooms that we have on here. The woolly pod um, just happens to have way more blooms at this point in time. So if we're using it for beneficial insects, that's probably how we're gonna attract the most when using vetch. Yeah, so for, from a vetch maturity standpoint, uh, to get it to this stage, it's always going to be winter planted hairy vetch first, and then spring planted woolly pod vetch, and then probably common vetch if you'd want to use that, and then the latest thing to bloom would be a spring planted hairy vetch. So if you're a if you're a, a, a beekeeper and you want to have vetch blossoms for as long a period as possible, plant some hairy vetch in the winter and then spring plant a combination of woolly pod, common vetch, and hairy vetch, and you'll you'll have uh, vetch blooming for probably three months. All right, now we have our 4010 spring peas. Uh, again, this is a spring annual. I think it's amazing how well these things look for being planted at the end of May. Typically, we would want to plant these at the end of March because that's that's their time frame. They, they grow really, really well with oats. Uh, they, they really hit that same growing window, the same uh, germination condition. So they typically would be used with oats. But as a summer planted crop, super impressive. Uh, a lot of growth, a lot of biomass here on these peas. You can see in the background, there's hardly any weeds back there at all. That is super impressive. And that was planted into all that big mat of uh, massive residue and looks really good. Uh, so we're using more and more spring peas in summer mixes all the time. Uh, again, just to give that additional diversity, it's nice to have a cool season legume with your warm season legumes growing through the summer uh, when it will do this. These are in uh, really hitting their stride with blooming. And uh, if you've ever been out to our field days uh, and Dale Strickler's been here, you'll probably see him. He'll pick these and eat them all day long. So for Dale, we'll, we'll eat one here. Uh, but Davis, what are your observations on these 4010s uh, that you've seen both in this plot and in other things? Like you mentioned, weed suppression is terrific. Um, one of the first things out of the ground and first things that you could really see defined rows on um, 
I, it's one of the most dynamic legumes for me, one that I'll use later into the summer on spring to summer mixes, and one of the first legumes that I'll start using again in fall mixes. Uh, so I, I like peas a lot. It was also interesting just with a huge canopy like this, when we were mowing out some strips, uh, it was just muddy under there. It kept so much moisture in, um, and really even in dry times, uh, you could find moisture under there. And if you plant some of these, you can harvest these blossoms and eat them. They, they taste just like a pea. It, oh, yeah. It's incredible. You eat the flower, it tastes like a pea. Think about how beautiful of a plate you could present to your guests. So plant some peas for the soil, plant a few peas for the table. So uh, those are the peas. Now we also have chickpeas here. Uh, chickpeas are the same thing as a garbanzo bean. They're, they're the exact same plant. Uh, there's two different types. There's the, the desi types and there's the kabuli types. The kabulis are the big ones that are more human consumption. The desis are smaller chickpeas uh, that would typically get used for hummus and things like that. Not nearly as big of a plant as the peas, but probably a little bit more heat tolerant uh, as a general rule. You can kind of see it's got a great root structure there. Uh, again, chickpeas are not going to be quite as aggressive out of the gate. Uh, if you look back there, they do a decent job of weed suppression. We definitely got a better stand uh, on the back side than we did in the front side. Uh, we like chickpeas as a part of a mix. They, they have some cold tolerance, but they also have pretty good heat tolerance. So again, I would never recommend chickpeas as the only thing that you planted. They're susceptible to different diseases. That's, that's a huge issue in production. As part of a mix though, you're not gonna see that. Uh, so they're a nice little companion uh, with a mix. And then the last one that we'll hit kind of in this section here of, of these uh, larger seeded legumes, cool season legumes, is chicklean vetch. Now chicklean vetch, it, it's not really a vetch, and it's not really a pea, and it's not really a grass, but it's a little bit of all of those. Uh, it's a latherous variety, and in fact, some places it's called the grassy pea vine. Uh, to uh, designate the fact that it looks a little bit like a grass, a little bit like a pea, and a little bit like a vetch. So uh, this uh, chicklean vetch is a unique plant. Uh, it, it's a really, really good nitrogen fixer. Uh, it's got some pretty good cold tolerance, much like the spring pea does. Probably a better uh, nitrogen fixer than a spring pea, uh, but it's really only commercial use, Davis, is as a cover crop because the seed itself uh, contains neurotoxins. So you can't feed this seed to livestock. You can't cook it and eat it. The plant is fine. It's a great grazing plant. You can make hay out of it, but the seed itself, there's no commercial value to it except for planting again. Uh, so it's a really good green manure crop. Uh, again, our organic customers uh, really like using this as part of their spring planted nitrogen fixing mixes. All right, now we've got faba beans, or some people also call them bell beans. It, and I've heard it faba and fava. It's, it's all the same thing. Uh, we really like these faba beans. It's the only true bean that will tolerate cold, wet soils. Uh, all other beans need warmer soils. They can't handle uh, the wetter conditions nearly as well. What we really like about these things is the root structure. And I don't know how well you can see this, but it's just got a great, it's got a, a little bit of a tap root, but then a lot of branching roots as well. And even though this is only at 60 days of growth, this thing is just absolutely loaded with nodules. I wish, I wish each of you were here to be able to see this because it's truly impressive at how many nodules are on this young plant. Great nitrogen fixer. And again, it, this has a really good niche because it can handle that cold, wet soils planted earlier in the spring. Now they don't handle heat nearly as well as a lot of other plants. And we can start to see this here uh, because you can see these nice pretty white blossoms up on the top. Those, those are looking good. All of these down below here, look at this, they've turned black. These, have a, these are aborted blossoms because of the heat. Uh, faba beans do not like heat, uh, especially in the reproductive process. It's growing pretty good, uh, but all of these blossoms are going to abort because of the heat, and, and we would not have good seed yield here, but it's still a fantastic cover crop. Soybeans, everybody knows about soybeans, Davis, one of the most popular crops grown in the United States and in the world, but, but can also be a good cover crop. Now, we don't recommend soybeans as a cover crop if you've got soybeans as a regular part of your crop rotation because we wanna break those cycles for your cash crops. 
uh, rather than perpetuate them. But if you're not using soybeans as part of your cash cropping rotation, highly recommend soybeans uh, as part of your cover crop mix. Or you know, if you're a grazing guy, they're, they're great grazers. So we got two kinds of soybeans here. Uh, the first one, these 5518s, this is just kind of the, uh, this would be a production soybean. We use it a lot for cover crops because it's a relatively inexpensive uh, one to grow and we can sell. It's a non-GMO bean. Uh, it's a group 5.5 uh, production bean. But again, as you take that uh, later group 5 bean and move it north, it becomes more of a forage type soybean. We would never grow a 5.5 here for, for seed production because they won't make seed early enough before it gets caught with the frost. So as you move a bean north, it becomes more of a forage soybean. And as you take it south, it becomes more of a grain type soybean. So we really like this one as we come from Nebraska and north because it really acts like a forage bean. And then we have the Laredos. The Laredos, when you plant these, they don't even look like a soybean because they're, they're very small. They're black seeded. Uh, it's, it's the original soybean that came over from China 150 years ago and that all these other soybeans have been bred from. So it's, it costs more, I'm not gonna lie to you there, but the seed size is significantly smaller, so you get a lot more seeds per pound. And it's, it's more of a group six, six and a half type soybean. It's gonna be more of a forage type. Uh, Davis, what were some of the observations you've seen between these two beans as they've been growing in the plots? It's really been in the last week or two that the Laredos have caught up to the earlier maturing 5518s. Um, but yeah, now as we expect the rest of the summer to progress, I, I would expect the Laredos to continue to maybe even take the lead compared um, with the 5518s. Yeah, and with that small seed size and with their more vining and, and forage production ability, it's very popular in food plot mixes. Uh, and they're, they're great for deer food plots if you can keep the deer from eating them. Deer love soybeans. The biggest problem with planting soybeans for deer is that you'll never see them get this big because the deer just keep eating them. Now we come to the mung beans and the cow peas. Probably the most, uh, among the most heat tolerant, drought tolerant of all the summer legumes. We use a lot of both of these. Uh, the mung beans here where Davis is standing, uh, the, the difference between mung beans and cow peas, mung beans are a little shorter season, they're more determinant, which simply means they're going to grow to their reproductive point uh, at, at a much more set pace and schedule. They accumulate so many growing degree days. They'll start blooming here pretty soon and then they start making seed pods. Cow peas are much more indeterminate. They'll grow for a much longer period of time. Uh, they'll, they'll accumulate more biomass in the long run. Now I'd say in this first 60 days, it's pretty similar. Uh, now in the next 60 days, if we don't get a frost, uh, you'll see the cow peas out perform the mung beans from that standpoint. So advantages and disadvantages to that. If you have a shorter time window to, to grow your summer legume, a mung bean can be a really good option. The seed size is about half of on a mung bean than it is on a cow pea. Pricing, they're about the same. So you, it's probably a better value. Uh, but if you have a longer period of time for something to grow, then the cow pea is probably a better choice because you'll get more overall. Uh, the mung beans uh, tend to have a little bit larger leaf uh, than, the, than the cow peas. The cow peas will tend to be a little bit more viney type, especially the red rippers. Uh, they tend to vine. We don't see a lot of vining out here right now because they've got nothing to vine on and climb on. They're just growing all by themselves. When we look at them in the mixes later, uh, we'll likely be able to see them start tendriling up uh, the different uh, uh, taller plants. Just wanted to show quick here this root system on, on a cow pea. Uh, again, it's got that tap root and then a lot of these nice branching roots here as well. And again, good nodulation formation uh, on this cow pea uh, that I just pulled out of the soil here. So again, we use a lot of cow peas. Uh, the iron and clays uh, this year, uh, Davis, kind of looks different than last year. Tell, tell just a little bit about your observations there. Yeah, all year the iron and clays have just been a little bit ahead of the red rippers and really formed a gorgeous stand here. Um, that's not always the case. The red rippers uh, we would maybe sell more of, um, but this year it just happens to be that way. We're not exactly sure why. Yeah, and from a weed control standpoint, there's weeds back there. Uh, you know, again, we would not want to recommend that anybody plant these by themselves. They're a great companion. We'd want to see some millet some sorghums or corn or something in there uh, because when we get to the mixes, it's just 
fantastic weed suppression in the mixes that we just don't see in anything that's planted by itself. If somebody's looking for short season uh, grazing or haying, something that they're going to hay multiple times, I like using the mung beans because, because of the value um, and the shorter maturity, I think that's your better bang for the buck. But if somebody's going for one max cutting, uh, I like the cow peas um, just going to, like you said, outproduce them yep. in the long run. Then we come to a couple of our very tropical type legumes. We've got sun hemp here and we've also got cisbania. We'll kind of talk about them as a set. Uh, these both, we imported these from India. They're both very tropical plants. They love growing close to the equator. Uh, they, will, they will grow for long periods of time if you have a lot of heat, a lot of sunlight. Here, uh, where we're at here in Nebraska, we've got a window of time where they grow really aggressively. And then as we start getting shorter days, they, they really start to kind of slow down in their growth. But sun hemp, a uh, very popular plant. We use a lot of sun hemp in our summer mixes. Uh, the deer plot guys like it too. It's very palatable uh, to deer. Um, it's, it's a fast growing legume. Uh, you know, we would expect to see, uh, you know, we'll see another couple feet of growth uh, out of sun hemp here before the summer's over. Can be, a, you know, can produce 150, 160 pounds of nitrogen in a good stand, in a good growth. Uh, so again, we don't necessarily want to recommend planting this by itself, but in combination with some sorghums or millets or things like that, uh, it can be a really good addition to that warm season mix. And then Cisbania is another really warm season tropical type legume big old thick stem on this thing we don't sell a lot of this we're still kind of evaluating it we had it in our plots last year we really liked what we saw uh, this stuff last year got about eight feet tall so I'm excited to see how much taller it will get you know we're only about four feet tall here right now uh, so this has a lot of growth left in it. We'll see a lot more biomass accumulation in both of these plants, but especially the Cisbania. Uh, so we're kind of excited to see what that looks like this year. Davis, what are your experiences or, or observations on these two? Well, if a Nebraskan wanted to plant a palm tree, this is about as close <laughs> as you could get because that's what they look like as they're coming up. They look like just mini palm trees out there. Uh, they're kind of humorous to evaluate. Um, but like you said, something that we're still learning about. I have seen pictures uh, of these next to each other. A uh, customer sent some pictures from Texas and it was amazing the nodules that he was seeing on this versus that. Um, but I don't know if that would be repeatable yet. At least I, I couldn't stand by that in most situations. So sun hemp is still the tropical tall legume that we're most comfortable with. <laughs> and, it's, and it's gonna be the easier one to find and uh, cheaper right now. Now, the other thing I wanna point out with both of these plants, now the first frost is gonna kill either one of these. So uh, for us up here in Nebraska, you know, as our days get shorter, these things will really slow down and then when it freezes, they'll be dead. But anything with a big stem like this is gonna be really susceptible to being terminated with a roller crimper. And so you can imagine if this gets another couple feet of growth, and they want to terminate with a roller crimper, it's just gonna snap just like that. Same way with this one. This is even more, because it's a little bit more of a hollow stem. So if you're in a more warm environment and you're not gonna have these winter killed uh, with the weather, uh, a roller crimper will be very effective at terminating these larger stemmed plants. Davis, when people think about cover crops, they don't often think about corn, but, but corn can be a good cover crop. But kind of like soybeans, we don't recommend using corn as a cover crop if you've got corn as a major part of your crop rotation. But these grazing corns are a really good fit in certain situations for the grazing guy. These are not corns that you're going to want to plant and try to harvest grain off of. There's far better choices for that. Uh, but these are going to be hard to beat for the value and for their palatability. So the brown midrib gene that they bred into these plants uh, make it super, super palatable. I have seen cattle come out in plots and they'll eat this stuff right to the ground uh, and they'll bypass the brown midrib sorghum. So it's a very, very palatable uh, crop. Now, uh, these are short season. We have an 84 day and a 90 day grazing corn. Uh, so where they fit well is if you have a relatively short period of time uh, to grow and then you want to graze. So you'd see 60 days of growth, we're well into tassel here on the 84 day. Uh, the 90 day is just getting ready to start tasseling good. So if you've only got that 60 to 75 day window, uh, you can put this in. 
corn is not going to regrow like sorghum does so don't use this if you want to do multiple grazings it's not going to be a good fit for that but where corn has an advantage over sorghum is either planted earlier in the season or planted later because it can tolerate much cooler nights than what sorghum does so i could plant this corn may 1st and i'll have significantly more growth through the month of may than i would with sorghum june and july advantage to the sorghum we come back to august advantage comes back to the corn because now august and september i'm going to start getting cooler evenings especially the second part of august the corn is going to do better in that time frame than what a sorghum does so there's a niche for it there's a place for it it's not for everybody it's not for every condition uh, but where it fits it works really well and it's an inexpensive way to raise a lot of forage for your cattle our other corn that we're going to look at today, Davis, is, is called Jimmy Red Corn. Kind of fun to say, really fun to look at, and it's a very interesting one. It's, it's not a brown midrib, unlike the 84 and the 90 day that we just looked at, but it is an open pollinated corn. It's a real old, we would almost call it an heirloom type variety. This variety is, is probably a couple hundred years old. It's kind of making a little bit of a resurgence in, in, the, uh, in the food industry because it's, it's a really naturally sweet tasting corn, makes great cornbread, uh, and, and it's a non-GMO corn, so a lot of people like using it for those sorts of things. A few innovative people are making whiskey out of it. I haven't tried that yet, uh, but I understand it's quite good as well. So you can see it's a much longer season corn than the 84 and the 90. Uh, we're at 60 days, it's much taller than they are, uh, and it isn't yet starting to tassel. So what we're looking at, we're, again, we're evaluating this. We've got this out with some of our good cattle customers. They're gonna do grazing trials. Uh, we think that this is gonna be just as palatable as, as the BMR corns. Uh, because it's an, an old heirloom type variety, it hasn't been bred with as much lignin uh, for standability as what some of the newer hybrids are. So we think it's still gonna have the palatability uh, combined with more growth. Uh, so we may be switching over to this in the future for our grazing corn simply because we feel like it's going to give us uh, more tonnage potential um, and, and uh, it's, it's an open pollinated so we've got a production field right across the road here so we're looking at how it's going to produce for us uh, in a commercial situation as well. So uh, keep your ears open for Jimmy Red Corn. Uh, we hope to have a lot more of it in the future. Popcorn. Uh, again, is not commonly thought of as a cover crop. We really like it. Uh, you can see it's not going to get as tall or as big or as robust as a commercial type corn plant, it, and it never does in a commercial field either. But there's some distinct advantages of using popcorn over any other type of corn for grazing. First of all, if you're an organic producer, uh, there's no danger of GMO contamination in popcorn because uh, popcorn and the field corns will not cross pollinate. And there's no GMO popcorn, so we're, we're, we got a high level of confidence that it's pure non-GMO. The other thing is it's much, much smaller seeded. You probably get three popcorn kernels for every kernel of commercial corn. Uh, so even though it costs a little bit more per pound, it's considerably less per acre and it, it mixes well with the other smaller seeded things. And you can see, Davis, you got a great stand on this popcorn, uh, and it's thick, and that's okay because when you plant corn thick, what you give up is ear development, the ear size. We don't care about that in our grazing corns. We're just, it's all about the biomass. So Davis, tell us a little bit about how you use popcorn in your grazing mixes and what your observations are. We planted all of our other grazing corns at a higher rate than what we did with the popcorn uh, when we're talking of pounds per acre. Um, but yeah, as we even reduce the pounds per acre, we still are probably getting more plants out yeah. here. Uh, and you can really see that better weed suppression. Um, like you said, being shorter, uh, less mature at this point, it also has softer leaves. And so I really like that part of it. Uh, one of the last reasons I think we see a better stand of it here um, than what we saw from our other grazing corns is again because of that seed size with our wet conditions where we were getting some hair pinning. I think this was able to find that trench a little bit easier than the larger seeded corn. The other thing to note on this is we went to several popcorn companies and we told them we wanted the, the biggest, leafiest popcorn variety that they had because we didn't care about the ears. We just wanted a bigger plant. And so even though this is shorter than, than the other corn next to it, uh, it's going to be a taller, more robust plant than most popcorn varieties. So it, it's, it's kind of that leafy forage type popcorn. Now we move into our warm season sorghums and millets. 
Uh, probably the most popular warm season grasses. We sell a lot of sorghum and millet, and there are a lot of different sorghums. Sorghums are probably the one cover crop that there you see the most uh, uh, new things coming out year after year after year because there are uh, quite a few good companies who have good plant breeders uh, that are actively breeding new lines of sorghum because it's such a popular forage, widely used for silage, for hay, for green chopping, for grazing. There's just a big market for sorghums, and so you see companies that are coming out with new genetics every year, which is good. That's exciting. I wish that happened with more of the other things, but yeah, maybe someday. So we've got a lot of sorghums to talk about. We're not going to be able to get into super good depth on any of them, but we're going to talk about traits as much as anything. Uh, so again, the BMR stands for brown midrib, and what that is is when they can get the BMR gene to express itself, uh, it reduces the amount of lignin that is in the plant, in the stalk and in the leaf, and the actual middle rib of that plant will be brown, uh, thus the BMR. Uh, but what it means is it's got less lignin, so it is a much more palatable plant for animals. Less lignin means more palatability. Think of it, I, I, I talk about this as like an apple versus eating celery. Celery has a lot of lignin, uh, an apple doesn't have near as much, so it's going to be uh, sweeter, more digestible, and uh, easier to get livestock to eat. So the BMRs are by far the best for grazing, for haying, for anything that's going to go through an animal. The non-BMRs are going to be cheaper, they're going to stand better in the winter, and so if you're not planning on grazing them, I don't think you should use a BMR. Save your money, put it into some other things, and, and we've got some non-BMR ones down here that will show you. A lot of the other traits can be very similar. So uh, these first two, the Sweet Forever and the 1220, they also have a trait in addition to the BMR uh, called photoperiod sensitive, often abbreviated as PPS. And what that means is this plant, and we don't see it now because we're only 60 days into the growing season, but this plant will not go reproductive until there's less than 12 hours and 20 minutes of daylight left. And so what triggers reproduction in this is simply day length. So this can be planted the end of May. This will grow all the way till about September 20th. Uh, and this will, you know, in our plots last year, this is one of the tallest things out here. It probably got 10, 11, 12 feet tall. It was up there because it just grows and grows and grows. It's not triggered reproduction by growing degree days, anything like that. It's just simply 12 hours and 20 minutes of daylight and then boom, it will go reproductive. But here in Nebraska, by that time, it's going to freeze out before it makes any viable seed. So the PPS types, photoperiod sensitive, are great ones to use if you got a long growing season and you absolutely do not want any seed produced. The Sweet Six Dry Stock Davis, this, this is another BMR type, but is not photoperiod sensitive. This one will trigger product or reproduction uh, based on growing degree days. It's one of the fastest growing sorghums that we have. It's not gonna be one of the highest yielding if you wanna let it grow over 90 days, but it will be one of the fastest growing and highest yielding if you've got 50 days, 60 days. And it regrows exceptionally well. So this is probably our most popular one for people that want to get multiple cuttings of hay. It also has what's called the dry stock gene in it, which when it's expressed, uh, and, and by the way, all these sorghums are non-GMO. When I talk about these genes and they breed it and they express it, it's all through traditional plant breeding methods, so no GMOs in the sorghums. Uh, but when they get the dry stock gene to express itself, there's less juice in the stock itself. It's still just as sweet, it's just less juicy. And so when you cut it and put it in a windrow, you're gonna be able to bale that up a few days sooner. Uh, at least a day sooner. And so it's a very popular one for guys that are putting up hay. Uh, there's better choices if you've got that long growing season window, but it's our, it's our go-to one for hay production. All right, now we come to our BMR dwarf sorghum sedan and the dwarf trait, the brachitic dwarf trait, again, it's another gene that when the breeders can get it to express itself, it shortens the distance between the nodes on the plant. And so every sorghum plant is going to have nodes, and a node is where the leaves come out of the stalk. And uh, every sorghum plant is going to have the same number of nodes for the most part. But in a brachitic dwarf, they've, they've shortened the distance between the nodes. So in essence, what you get, Davis, is you get the same number of leaves on a shorter plant. And there's some real advantages to that. Number one, uh, the leaves are much more nutritious, palatable, and digestible than the stalk is. So you have a higher 
uh, uh, leaf to stem ratio, so it's going to be a more palatable plant for grazing. Uh, it stands better into the winter, so a lot of times for winter stockpile, we like the dwarf trait because it's a more compact plant, doesn't catch as much wind, isn't as likely to blow over if you still want this standing out here in December for winter grazing. And the other thing that we like about it, again, because the plant is kind of compressed, the actual growing point on it is closer to the ground. And so we tend to see better regrowth, especially after a grazing uh, or a trampling type effect. Uh, and, and we like that because this is gonna regrow better than some of the other ones in a grazing situation. Also, because this plant is gonna have all of its leaves in probably a six or seven foot plant instead of a 10 or 12 foot plant, it's just easier for the cattle to get to it. You know, you get a 10 foot tall sorghum plant out there, they literally have to push that plant over to get those top leaves, where this one, they can get the majority of it by just stretching their neck up there. Yeah, some people like that better. They, they feel their cattle are more likely to go out into it. Uh, had a customer who has buffalo. He likes being able to know a little bit better where his buffalo are at <laughs> if he's checking the herd. So um, yeah, there's pros to having it be yeah. shorter. Again, if you want to just produce as much biomass as possible and you're not going to graze it, this one's not for you, uh, but this next one is. Now we've got a couple things out here, Davis, that, that do not have the brown midrib trait. Uh, so these would be the ones, if you're not grazing, these is what you'd want to use. They're, they're a little less expensive because it doesn't have that BMR trait. Uh, uh, but these do have some specific traits. So Yield Max, uh, it's very similar to that Sweet Forever, very similar base genetics, but it doesn't have the BMR. But this one is photoperiod sensitive. So again, we're only at 60 days of growth, so we're not seeing these differences. Uh, but this one, again, will get 10 to 12 feet tall. Because of that photoperiod sensitive gene, we're not gonna see any reproductive traits until uh, third week in September here. So a very, very good one to use if you're in a situation where you're gonna wanna let it grow to maximum tonnage with no seed production. So this is a really safe one to use. And then the next one is Super Sugar DM. The DM just simply stands for delayed maturity. So uh, it's just a very simple, it's, it's not brown midrib, it's not photoperiod sensitive, it's not brachytic dwarf, it's just a basic cross between a sedan grass and a forage sorghum plant to get the sorghum sedan. Uh, but it is a longer maturity. It's a delayed maturity uh, over just a base uh, super sugar, straight, simple three-way cross. So again, we would want to use this if we've got a longer period of time to grow and, and our customer does not want to see that seed production, which could lead to uh, either issues with cattle grazing too much grain or volunteer sorghum plants the next year. Now we come to our forage sorghum. So Davis, these are not crossed with a sedan grass, so they're just straight sorghum. Uh, typically, they're going to be a larger diameter stock. They're going to stand better. Uh, they're not going to regrow as well as a sorghum sedan. So the better choice for these is either going to be a single cut hay or better yet, a silage, a green chop uh, is where you see a lot of forage sorghums used. We also like these a lot for that winter stockpile. We're going to grow it through the summer. We're going to let the frost kill it, and then we're going to be coming in with cattle and grazing this in you know November, December, January, because they stand really well. Even if you get some snow, the cattle will still be able to find it. And sorghum holds its nutritional content far better than what millets do uh, into the winter, and, and better than corn as well. So they're really good for that winter stockpile grazing. Uh, so the FS105, uh, this is a brown midrib, so it's got the BMR trait that we've already talked about, but it also is what's called male sterile, and that's designated by the MS. And what male sterile means is that this plant will grow, it will put a head on, but the pollen is, it's a sterile pollen, so that head will not form any grain unless it gets pollen from another sorghum source. Now, there's some advantages to that. You may or may not want the grain. If you're taking it for silage, you might want the grain. If you're grazing it, you probably don't. But when it doesn't form grain in the head, all the sugars will stay in the stalk. And so typically, you will have sweeter plants uh, at maturity with a male sterile. So, so like where they make molasses uh, out of sorghum molasses, those are typically a sterile type plant because all the sugar stays in the stalk and it's not translocating that up to the grain. So a lot of times we'll use these male sterols, again, for something that's gonna grow for a long period of time. We wanna have that sweetness in the stock, and we don't wanna have the issue with having grain in there. 
A uh, couple other ones that we have here, the D90 and the D110, these are similar. They're forage sorghums, just like uh, the FS105 was, but these have, again, have that brachytic dwarf trait. Uh, they're gonna be a shorter statured plant. The leaves are gonna be closer together. They're gonna be compacted. They're not male sterile, so these will put on a seed head. Uh, this one, uh, the 90, this is 90 days to the soft dough stage. The one next to it is 110 days. So depending on how long you have for these to grow, and if and when you want that seed head to be put on, you can choose. These are very popular for the silage guys uh, because they're gonna be a very compact plant with lots and lots of leaves, and they will form a grain head given enough time. And in a silage setting, that can be a good thing to have the uh, additional energy boost from that grain. Coes is another type of forage sorghum. It's, again, it's a heirloom or heritage type. It's, it's an old, old variety that we kind of almost resurrected from the dead. Hardly anybody was planting it. It's got some distinct advantages though. Number one, it is a completely open pollinated plant so we can produce it much cheaper uh, than we can have hybrids produced. Uh, the other thing is this was bred out in eastern Colorado. So if you've got higher altitudes or some cooler evenings, this is gonna be probably more adapted than all these other sorghums that are coming out of Texas. Uh, it, it's just, just going to be a little bit better adapted to altitude and some cooler evenings. Uh, Coes is what's called dual purpose. Uh, you can actually grow it and harvest a grain crop off of it, uh, but you can also harvest it for forage. It's going to get five to seven feet tall compared to some forage sorghums that will get you know eight, nine, ten feet tall. So it's not going to be as tall. Uh, so again, if you've got a shorter time frame, uh, uh, and, and you want to invest less money in the seed, the Coes is a great way to go. It's been very, very palatable for both grazing and haying, and the guys that have used it, they're ordering it again. They really like what they see. What have you seen with the Coes, Davis? We also will use it sometimes in wildlife mixes because uh, it is a little bit shorter maturity. It also is uh, working on pushing some heads here, yep. so um, we even have it next to our green uh, wildlife blend. Uh, because it is probably going to be one of the first to produce uh, grain that are likely to attract birds. Yeah. So just think of it kind of as a taller version of a grain sorghum uh, with more forage potential. Right. Our last two entries in our sorghum plots here, Davis, uh, we've got Egyptian wheat and we've got Piper sedan grass. Now Egyptian wheat is, is not a weed at all. I have no idea why it's called Egyptian wheat. It is a sorghum. It's an old variety of sorghum. It's an open pollinated. Uh, Mostly popular, again, amongst the wildlife crowd. It'll get really tall. This will be one of the tallest sorghums out here. It's not that tall yet, but this sucker will just keep growing and growing, and it will be 10, 11, 12 feet tall. We use it in our view blocker mix if you want to have a, a living screen to, to hide something, hide a food plot, uh, hide your house from the road or whatever. It's popular amongst the food plotters because when it does form a head, it's a very open type head. Uh, so it's easy for the birds to pick that seed out. And then it also kind of breaks over about in the middle uh, after a frost. And so what you'll see is you'll have this tall sorghum, but it's kind of broken over so that seed head is pretty close to the ground and it's much easier for the birds and the, and the animals and the wildlife to get to it. So mostly popular amongst them. Uh, it is a pretty drought tolerant plant. We've seen this do better than some of these others in real droughty type conditions. Uh, but it's not going to have nearly the palatability, uh, nearly the tonnage production that your brown mid ribs will. So use it in specialty applications. Uh, it's, a, it's a real bear to harvest seed off of, so seed is more expensive uh, because it's a 12 foot tall plant that wants to fall over. And that's not a good recipe for harvesting large seed yields. And then the last thing that we have here, and Davis is holding an example of it, this is Piper sedan grass. We don't sell a lot of Piper uh, into the, the cover crop or grazing market because it's not as productive as, as some of the other sorghum sedan crosses. But I want to show you this because this is the main parent plant for that sorghum sedan cross. So this is straight sedan grass. A sorghum sedan is a cross between the forage sorghum and this plant right here, uh, a sedan grass like this. 
Uh, you can see it's got good growth. It's as tall as anything out here in 60 days. It's fine stem, so if you're managing it right, haying it or grazing it, it can be very good forage. It can be very palatable, but you want to kind of get it early on. It'll just kind of continue to get a little stemmier and less and less palatable as it grows. It regrows very well, uh, so if you want to hay it, you'd probably want to be haying this now and then catching a regrowth and getting a second uh, grazing on it. So it, it's a very good plant for, for those situations. Again, as just as simply as a cover crop, it'll be great. You know, it'll break down a little quicker than a sorghum sedan or a forage sorghum, uh, and it will produce a lot of tonnage for you. So there's places where it would be used. It's just not the best plant for a strictly a forage setting. Davis, now we come to our millet section of our plots, and, and millets uh, are a warm season grass, just, just like the sorghums were. They're a C4 grass, which means they photosynthesize at a higher rate than your cereals like oats and, and barley and wheat. Uh, but, but they're typically a shorter season. Uh, uh, they don't grow for as long before they start that reproductive process as sorghums. So they're not as widely used or as commonly used, but they sure do have a niche or a fit. Now, one thing we didn't talk about with the sorghums is with sorghums, you get a condition called prussic acid. And so if you're grazing, uh, particularly at the time of the first frost, sorghums can present a problem. People have killed cattle with prussic acid by not grazing their sorghum, not managing it properly. Uh, and so that is a concern or an issue with sorghum at the time of the first frost particularly. Millet has no prussic acid. So one place that we see a, a lot of millet being used is if a customer says, I want to be grazing this in September and October, which is you know when typically a lot of people get their frost, and they don't want to have to pull cattle out or have to manage around that prussic acid issue, uh, we will use a millet-based mix because we don't have that concern, we don't have that issue. It's very fine stemmed compared to the sorghums. You're going you're gonna to have a higher palatability just simply because the stem is so fine and there's a lot of leaf to it. We don't typically see a lot of brown midrib traits in millet. Now there is a BMR pearl millet, super expensive. Uh, it's just not on the market very much. It's not widely produced. Again, because millets don't need that trait to have the palatability uh, because they're just naturally fine stem. So what we see here, uh, we have pearl millet, and pearl is a true hybrid. They're, they're producing this by doing a male-female cross every year. It's more expensive seed. Uh, it's, it's more like a top-end sorghum sedan hybrid because it's just a much more difficult process to grow a hybrid seed versus open pollinated. The advantages, however, are that it's a longer season millet. It's going to grow for a longer period of time, produce more biomass before it puts a head on, uh, and it regrows very, very well. So pearl millet's a great one to have in a grazing mix. We're going to do multiple grazings. It's a great one if you want to put up millet for hay uh, in, and you want multiple cuttings because it's going to be the best of the regrowing uh, traits in the millets. And right next to it, we have brown top. Brown top's one, quickly becoming one of our favorite millets to put in grazing mixes. Uh, it's used commonly, more commonly, I would say, in the south, but we've brought it north and it's done great up here. In fact, we're doing production on brown top millet in Nebraska now, uh, and it's doing very, very well. Uh, it, you can see it's starting to put seed heads on, so it's a shorter season variety than what pearl millet is. But the thing that we like about brown top, and it's called brown top because where most plants, they mature from the bottom up, and, they, and the plant starts turning brown before it goes reproductive, brown top will go all the way through its reproductive stage and the plant stays very, very green. In fact, you'll see that seed head turn brown while the plant is still green, and that's why it's called brown top millet. So even at a mature stage, it holds its palatability better than some of the other millets when they hit that reproductive and mature stage. So it's, it's quickly becoming one of our favorite of the open pollinated. This is an open pollinated one. All these other millets are open pollinated. It's quickly becoming our favorite open pollinated millet for the grazing. From, from a hay standpoint, uh, there's probably better millets. From a grazing standpoint, uh, we really like the brown top. Yeah, and one that we'll put in a lot of stockpile mixes, winter stockpile, keeps its feed quality pretty well. Um, and also a full seeding rate of 15 pounds. If you throw two pounds in there, spending very little money for some um, good late season feed quality. Okay, now we come to our hay millets. We have the white wonder and we have the golden German millet. 
Uh, more people are familiar with golden German millet, but the, they're both foxtail millets. Uh, mostly used for hay. They're called foxtail millets because you can see as these are just now starting to go reproductive, they have a head that, that looks like a foxtail plant. Uh, but look at the big wide leaf on that thing. This is a really good, inexpensive way to produce a quick hay crop. Uh, so we're 60 days out. These are just starting to put some heads on. This could be hayed right now. You could wait another week or so, get a little more growth and still make good hay. Again, very fine stemmed inexpensive because it's an open pollinated type. We, we personally think the White Wonder uh, is a little more productive, <clears throat> has a little wider leaf. Uh, we just like it a little bit more. The, the Golden German uh, is, has been around longer uh, and more people are familiar with it. Uh, but both of these are popular for, for hay production. They're not going to regrow nearly as well. So if you want to get multiple cuttings of hay, we'd still go with the Pearl Millet. But for a short duration, single cutting hay, the, these would be hard to beat. Especially if you're uh, in a very dry, arid area, you may not have enough moisture to grow an eight foot tall sorghum hay crop, but most places, most years, you're gonna have enough moisture uh, to grow a millet hay crop because it's just, it doesn't get as big before it makes maturity so that you can produce something on less moisture. Watching these early on, as well as the Japanese melt, which we'll get to, these are the first millets to jump out of the ground. And uh, honestly, even sometimes ahead of the sorghum sedan, uh, it seems like they can handle a little bit cooler soil, um, just getting up quick. The other thing I want to point out here, and we didn't mention it during the sorghum tour, but if you look in the background, uh, again, back behind that mode strip, Davis and his guys did no weeding back there whatsoever and really didn't need to. There's not many weeds back there. The sorghums and the millets and, and really all the grasses have done a very good job of suppressing weeds on their own. Uh, so that's why you can get it by with planting these in a monoculture for a haying situation. We still don't recommend it from a true soil health perspective. We'd like to see the mix, but they should all, you should always have a grass as part of your base mix because they're so good at suppressing weeds. They've got such massive fibrous root systems. They're just really good uh, at helping build the soil as well. So we always like to have grass as a component of a mix, uh, unless there's a specific reason not to. Our last two millets are Japanese millet and our proso millet. Japanese millet is also known as duck millet. Uh, what makes it quite unique amongst really all of the warm season grasses it's got such great tolerance to growing in waterlogged soils. And, and that's why it's called duck millet. It's often planted around the edges of duck ponds because it will literally grow in standing water. Uh, it produces a seed head. Davis has one here, you know, it's 60 days out. We're already producing grain on this thing. And so in, in a duck type habitat, you can grow this in the marshy areas, flood that thing later on and have great uh, duck habitat and a, a food source for the ducks as well. We do have people that use it for forage, for livestock forage, particularly in high pH or high salinity type settings. It's going to be by far the best millet to use. Uh, if you've got, uh, you know, normal pHs, normal conditions, well-drained soils, some of the other ones are probably better. But in those waterlogged or heavy uh, type soils, Japanese millet is a really good one. And then the proso millet. Proso is more of a grain type millet. Uh, this is the millet that uh, people would grow for an actual grain crop. Uh, a lot of this would go into the bird seed industry. It's a great uh, bird seed uh, product. We typically don't use it nearly as much for forage because in our area here, it just goes reproductive so fast at a much uh, less biomass production. But as you move north, uh, our, our our customers and our friends up in Montana, they use a lot of proso millet because their, their cooler summers allow this millet to grow longer and they'll get as much forage out of a proso millet at a, at a cheaper cost than they will out of some of these other millets. We don't see that in, the, in, in our hotter climates. Uh, the proso millet uh, goes reproductive quicker and will make a seed crop uh, with less forage biomass. So typically we'll see this used as a forage more in the north and as you come south, it's used more as a grain crop. However, if you're planting a wildlife habitat pl uh, type plot and you want to have a food source for your upland game birds, you know, pheasants, quail, turkey, doves, any of those, proso millet, you got to have that in there because it's just a very reliable seed producer and will produce a lot of good seed for those birds.
the book. Giant head. 